Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Jung Center. It's a, it's a real pleasure to see you all here today. Uh, I just will mention very briefly, the Jung Center has been in Houston since 1958 and mostly in this neighborhood. Uh, we, have, we present over 200 lectures, workshops, uh, programs, special events uh, every year on a wide range of topics. And, uh, and I encourage you to, to learn more about us. We're also a nonprofit organization, and uh, uh, so I encourage you to, uh, to learn more about us. Ask any of the staff members uh, after, the, after the lecture if you'd like to learn more about, uh, about us and, and what we do here. It is uh, a real pleasure to welcome Aaron uh, Prophet back to the Young Center to present. Uh, I've had the great pleasure of, of, of hearing this presentation and actually also of reading, uh, reading her book, uh, which I commend to you. Uh, it's, um, um, among many other things, it's, it's, uh, it's a, quite a compelling read and, and unusual in, uh, for those of us who have done a lot of reading in, in religious studies, it's, uh, it's unusual in that it's, it's riveting and it has a plot and it moves, <laughs> it moves right <laughs> along. <laughs> and uh, it's very thoughtful and, uh, and revealing of, of uh, of who Erin is and, and, uh, and her uh, remarkable journey. Um, and I will say not anything else about it because that's much of the subject of her, of her talk here. Erin um, um, is a doctoral student in religious studies at the University, or at Rice University just down the street. She studies with uh, some of my favorite folks, with, with April DeConnick and, and Jeff Kripal and um, uh, we're just honored to, to have you return. And also, I apologize, we, our bookstore's not open today. <laughs> so we would love to sell you copies, but we can't. <laughs> so that's, that's our fault. But anyway, welcome. Please welcome here. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Sean. It's great to be back here at the Young Center. And I, I find it to be a very appropriate venue for discussing what I'll be going over today and what, what's in my book. Before I get started, though, I'd like to just um, ask for a little help from the audience. Um, would someone here ask me to uh, make a prediction? <laughs> About something like uh, the weather or sporting event or anything like that. Oh, will we be going to war with Ukraine? That's a, that's a big topic. <laughs> um, uh, okay, someone in the back? Will they find the plane? Will they find the plane? <laughs> okay, well, fortunately I have a coin here. <laughs> so I'm going to, let's see, heads they'll find it. All right, they're going to find that plane. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, um, as you will have noticed, my last name is Prophet, and my, my parents uh, both uh, claim to be prophets, and so people are always asking me, is that your real last name? And in fact, it is. Um, it's, it's come, it comes from Scotland. My father's parents, uh, ancestors were from Canada. And um, so in any case, but it seemed to fit pretty well with their chosen vocation. In my case, I've gotten out of the prophecy business. Um, I was involved with my mother's early work, and I, that's one of the things I talk about in my book. But uh, I grew up, basically, my parents' church was what many people might call a cult. It's also more friendly, in a more friendly way, known as the new religious movement. I mean, cult really means a religion within the first generation of its founding. So, of course, it's got a lot of, lot of other connotations today, which we'll go into. But um, the main topic of the book and why people are so interested in it is because um, in the late 1980s, my mother began predicting that there was going to be a nuclear war. So, interestingly enough, now things have, have heated up. Uh, people are talking about a second, people are talking about a second Cold War. But, um, in the late 80s, of course, there, the Cold War was, was um, very tense, things were very tense, and my mother began saying that there, the Soviet Union was going to attack the United States. But not only that, but she began, she encouraged her followers to build uh, bomb shelters for themselves. And many of them did all over the world, people in Australia, Minneapolis, uh, Europe were making shelters, they were storing food and water, and at the main uh, ranch complex in Montana, 
we built what is still today the largest private fallout shelter complex in the United States. Um, so this obviously costs a lot of money, and uh, what I, I write about it as in relation to Jung's concept of the shadow because I think it's an example that can be instructive for in many situations today, whether it's with our interpersonal relations with um, in families, corporations, and even nation states, of what, what happens when people get into what you might call a fortress mentality. Um, so it's a multivalent experience. There are uh, many people who went through this, what I call the shelter episode, many people who were involved with my mother's church. And what I'm sharing is my experience. When I was finishing up the book towards the end of, of 2008, my theme song I kept listening to was, Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood because this type of story has, can be misunderstood. Um, some people thought that I wrote the book because I wanted to uh, show how my parents were just sort of making up their religion, or that they were phonies or frauds. That was not my intent. Um, people who were in the so-called anti-cult movement, uh, who believe that all cults are dangerous and people should leave them, these people said that I hadn't gone far enough and that, you know, yes, you, you told part of the story, but you needed to go all the way. Um, atheists uh, point to it as being a really good example of what happens when you get religion, why you should not have uh, religion at all. Uh, however, there are 4,000, I believe, uh, groups in the United States even today who have millennialist expectations, and only very few actually go, go to the extreme of preparing or building shelters or, you know, obviously there are different kinds of preparations depending on what your scenario is. Many of the people who were in my mother's church told me that I really didn't need to write this book at all. What I should have done is sat down and talked with a good therapist about the whole thing. Um, and in fact, I have talked to quite a few therapists. <laughs> and um, I have, uh, the, what's in the book is the part that I thought would be helpful to share. And uh, Finally, uh, family members and friends said, well, do you really need to talk about sex in your book? Because, you know, you can't take it back. And I think it will become clear to you when I finish uh, this talk with why I needed to talk about sex in the book. All right. So the book, when it came out, Prophet's Daughter, was pretty well received. It was uh, received a positive review in Publishers Weekly. I was on the Diane Rehm show. I had a book signing at the Harvard Coop, which was very exciting. And the events that took place really almost 25 years ago, most people in the nation were aware. This is the front page of the New York Times in 1990. Uh, my mother and thousands planned life below after doomsday. Um, what many people in the New Age uh, asked themselves when they saw this story is, how can you believe in peace and love and light and positive thinking and positive energy and go out and build shelters for yourselves and, and stock them with weapons? I mean, don't you believe in, in, in their positive thinking, after all? And um, my mother used to say that if you have a flat tire and... Uh, you're sitting by the side of the road and you pray to God, God isn't going to fix your tire for you, but he might send someone along, along to help you with it. So, I mean, I think that was the attitude that people in the church had, is that we need to be prepared somehow, and then God will do the rest, in a way. But there were places where I think that we went wrong, and I, I currently view the whole shelter episode as a mistake, but it's also something that is inextricably bound up in the belief system, and one of the things that frustrated me when I was, I was the church spokesman and I defended my mother in the press and on Oprah and Donahue, and uh, one of the things that used to bother me is that people would say, well, we don't really care what you believe. We just care what you do. And anyone who's uh, interested in religious studies will tell you that what you believe is, is extremely important to what you do, and people ignore it at, at their peril. So, I'm going to go a little bit into the beliefs, but um, first of all, I'd like to go ahead and just play a video clip from, from uh, that time period, 1990. <laughs> 
universal and triumphant. You know, a lot of people are saying it's a cult, but I wonder if that's really true. This is not a cult. This is a, a, a very stable religion with a past. She holds many very high religious titles, and they're all self-proclaimed. Any time after October 2nd for the next dozen years, there is a very high degree of potential for a Soviet uh, surprise first strike. There's been always been a series of disastrous predictions. That's how the church has kept itself together. Well, whether or not it's a cult, a lot of people are concerned about it. I think it's worth a look. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Upfront. I'm Ann Price. Just to the north of Yellowstone Park in Montana, there is a spacious ranch that is the home of a growing religious community, the Church Universal and Triumphant. As the church has grown in membership over the years, so has it grown in controversy. Many people have called it a religious cult, but church members just call it a religion, period. Okay, well, there is a lot of controversy surrounding mm -hmm. this. Now, with all the controversy and mystery surrounding the church, we decided to take our upfront cameras to Montana and see for ourselves. Montana's Paradise Valley. All seems calm, serene, but some folks in the valley say if you look closer, you'll find a serpent in paradise. This so-called serpent, they say, is the church universal and triumphant. Led by the charismatic Elizabeth Clare Prophet, the church and about 500 of its members have been settling here in Montana since 1981. Because of its unique blend of Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, and New Age philosophies, the church has often been labeled a cult. A term Elizabeth Prophet says is unfair. This is not a cult. This is a, a, a very stable religion with a path. Uh, people are very realistic. They don't worship me. They don't worship themselves. They worship God. Despite the cult label, membership has been growing, along with political power. With land holdings totaling 33,000 acres, the church is the second largest property owner in Park County, a fact which makes some townsfolk in nearby Livingston a little nervous. But it's not just the square acreage. It's what the church is building on their land, bomb shelters. Prophet has been warning of a nuclear attack sometime after October 2nd of this year. Prophet's following is preparing to go underground. And we are not a people are, who are about to say, if there's a nuclear war, we don't want to survive. We do want to survive because God gave us life. About 7,000 people live here in Livingston, Montana. And one of the words in their daily vocabulary is cut. The abbreviation for Church Universal and Triumphant. Since 1981, townspeople have been watching more and more cut members move here into the Paradise Valley. I know the people here have diversified opinions about the church. You can be sure that everyone has an opinion. Well, I guess because what I've seen so far is that they're real deceitful. You know, they're real closed mouth about everything that goes on there. Um, what is the phrase? Armageddon? You know, um, they from what I can see, are really pushing the fear buttons on people. They don't have any horns. Um, I can't tell that they're any different than, than any other people that I have to deal with. I have no problems with them at all. I'm not, I'm not really quite sure. You know, they're, they're so secretive, it's, it's a little bit hard to know for sure. So one of the reasons why this story became such national news was because weapons were purchased and also because the, there were environmental concerns because these shelters were being built right next to Yellowstone National Park. Um, in fact, some people in our church were arrested for illegally purchasing assault weapons, which, um, I mean, the idea was that they were to be used for defense. And if we had people from the Aryan nations who were say, telling us, well, we're going to wait till after the war, and then we're going to come down and take all of your food. I mean, I think if you start um, the idea that civilization is going to collapse, uh, weapons, the idea of weapons comes along. But as you'll see uh, from the story, um, I think that, that our attitudes were definitely conditioned by some of our, our religious beliefs and ideas. So what happened in the upshot of all of this shelter preparation is that we went underground for a couple of nights. We had some drills. There were people in the church who, close to my mother, who really thought that something might happen. And we, you know, we did a lot of things that you wouldn't do if you didn't think something was going to happen. Some people quit their jobs. Some people moved to Montana. They invested their life savings. And, and then there were, we changed uh, the date so that people were told, oh, well, we've 
it's been put off, you know, to give us more time to prepare. I don't have time to get into the, the sociological theory behind how that works and why people do that, but um, suffice it to say that you had people who were frightened. There were children involved who were getting, being gotten up in the middle of the night and asked to go into shelters and not being able to go to school and things like that. So I can't say that this episode had no victims. There was no violence, people, nobody was killed, the weapons weren't used, um, but you did have, have major upheaval and upset in people's lives. So of course when something like that happens, you begin to question, you begin to ask why it happened. There are a lot of the people in the church itself who, convinced, who are convinced that by doing these preparations, we prevented a war from happening and that we were obedient to the commands that were, were being given in the, uh, what we would call dictations, which were the messages that my mother took from, from ascended masters, which were beings of light, basically, who were more advanced and spiritually than we were. So many people would call this channeling. So we, we had obeyed, and we had, we had built the shelters, and nothing happened, and we went on, and the church still exists. And one of the reasons it exists is because it has a lot of people who care deeply about it and, and for whom the shelters were simply a side a sideline. What they really care about is the, the prayers and the spiritual techniques and how it makes them feel about their lives and, and getting off of drugs or, or whatever transition they went, in, went through when they, when they joined the church. In these pictures here, you could see this is, this is me and there are some other pe people. Uh, they look like, you know, normal average people that you might see They're from all over the world, um, many of them prosperous, um, middle class, well-educated. And we had our own culture. We had music, songs, dancing, food. We had alternative medicine. There was very heavy emphasis on alternative health. So it wasn't really just about ever about going to Montana and building shelters. At the same time, um, people say, well, there was damage done. And one of the, one of the ways that there was damage done is that um, people were asked to leave suddenly. People who, who questioned or who got into, quote, a negative attitude would be asked to leave and suddenly be cut off from all of their friends and family. And this is uh, something that happens in, in many religious groups, not just our own. So probably one of the reasons why I wanted to, to do religious studies is so that I could understand more about the dynamics. And, I still don't think I have all the answers. I don't know when a group goes from being a you know, positive, warm, and loving group to being something that's dangerous and negative. Um, I love my mother, and um, she passed away in 2009, and I appreciate what she brought to me and uh, the people she brought together, the people she exposed um, me to, the ideas. And what she and my father tried to do, my father was the one who started the church. In, in the late 1950s. And um, I see them as religious pioneers. I think when you're a pioneer, sometimes you go up a, a path and you have to turn around and go back uh, again. And it was my mother who introduced me to Jungian analysis. Uh, she never went through it herself, but she was considered herself to be a broad-minded, open-minded person. And she would, was constantly looking for new streams of thought and new ideas to bring into her work. Uh, let's just play this, this next short clip. It's about cults. People have labeled Church Universal and Triumphant a cult. What's your response to that? Well, I think that it's a little bit irresponsible to label us a cult in the, the current way in which the term cult is used, which is negative. Uh, I've compared us to the, the laundry list of, of supposedly what defines a cult, and we just don't really fit it. Okay. Bud, why, is, why would you call it? C-U-T, a cult? Well, I, I start off by saying the word cult comes from the Latin cultus, which is really not a very bad term. It means nourishing, tending, but it's not something that's very positive these days, and I'm sure a lot of groups don't like to be called cults. But uh, I wrote a book called The Power of Persuasion, and I have a chapter called Cults. In fact, I use one of the ex-cult members from Spokane, Liz, as an example. And the reason I call it a cult is because it typifies what a cult does, and that is they're led by a charismatic leader, there's a certain amount of fear. There's almost always a scapegoat. In the case of the Church Universal Triumphant, uh, communism seems to be a scapegoat. And so when I examine uh, CUT, it seems that they fit what we typically now refer to as a cult. 
And that's, and again, I don't see it so much as a pejorative term, although I would not like to be called a member of a cult, I have to admit. But I don't see it as negative as a lot of people do. So that was uh, Bud Hazel from, from Gonzaga University. And um, he was quite a fair person to, to be interviewed across from. Um, this is a little New Yorker cartoon. Yeah, nobody, nobody really like, nobody calls themselves a cult. Um, people don't start off being cults. And contrary to what Mr. Dr. Hazel said in, in the interview, you know, most churches have charismatic leaders. Um, many churches have scapegoats. It's difficult to identify what defines a, what some people call a destructive cult versus a mainstream religion, other than the fact that it's new and different and it's doing things that people don't really like. So um, as promised, I'm going to go a little bit into the beliefs. Um, is anyone in the room familiar with the I am religious activity? And so a number of people have heard of it. This was a group that was popular in the 1930s, and a lot of the people in our group had come out of it. And it was all about positive affirmations. I am light, I am whole, I am healthy. And um, there were almost a million people in the I am group back in the 1930s. They suffered a dramatic loss in, uh, during the 50s and 60s, and a lot of those people started their own groups. And my father, uh, so did, and many of the people in his group were elderly, they had been in the IM group, and one of the things that the IM taught was that they were 100% they were vegetarian, and they believed that sex uh, was unnecessary. And so in our group, we actually kind of liberalized that a little bit. Sex was okay for uh, procreation and for some balancing the masculine fem and feminine energies, but it was only okay uh, if you were married. And so people in, in our group uh, you could be dismissed or kicked out if you had broken some of those rules, if you were having sex outside of marriage. And there were um, other rules too, but that turned out to play a role. Um, also homosexuality or any kind of alternative sexuality was simply not, not accepted, acceptable. And my mother stepped into this, this belief system. She didn't start it herself, but she was expected to follow it and she decided how these rules were going to be enforced in our group. And in, in some ways she liberalized, and in some ways she didn't. So we'll, we'll see, but you can, I see her as a, a spiritual genius. I mean, she had a healing ministry. She has a lot of testimonials of people who felt they'd been healed of something by her touching them. Um, she gave counsel and advice. Um, this is my father. Um, and she also grew and changed over time. She was really a pretty bold person. I mean, she took a lot of, un of controversial and unpopular stands politically, especially during the se late 70s and early 80s. So one of the things about positive thinking, and I don't know how many of you have read The Secret. So The Secret, <laughs> good, not too many people have read The Secret. So basically the idea is, is that you can bring to yourself all the good things you want through your thoughts and through af positive affirmations. And that's all well and good so long as things are going well for you. But when things stop going well, then there becomes a problem. Because if you believe that you're responsible, that you create the, the world around you, and you bring things to yourself, then when something bad happens, you, you really can only either blame yourself or you can try to look to some outside evil force. And we did both in our group. And we used what we called the violet flame, which is this purple energy which we would visualize. Um, and people used it for heart disease, for example. They would visualize their heart surrounded in, in violet flame energy. And there were people who had testimonials that they had been healed that way. But one of the things that happens in the downside of positive thinking, what I call is when positive thinking can become negative, um, as William James pointed out, he, was, he wrote extensively about the positive thinking movement, which was also known as sort of the healthy living, healthy minded. Um, he said, the skull will grin in at the banquet. In other words, you're having this wonderful love feast of posit positivity and joy, and eventually something's going to happen. People become ill, there are accidents, people die, and then we have to explain it in some way. Christian science is an example of a positive thinking movement that was extremely popular around the turn of the 20th century. And Mary Baker Eddy, the founder, 
um, she got into this sort of negativity where she was convinced that it was people in her group using their minds who had killed her husband, Mr. Eddie. And so, you know, then she developed these ideas of sort of self, spiritual self-defense, where you're trying to protect yourself from other people's bad energies. And so in our group, we spent a fair amount of time doing this. And it comes, it comes along because uh, it, there were people, when someone would leave, they would be criticized um, for, or we would identify them as the cause of some terrible negative thing that happened. If there was a car accident, oh, it was because you know, it was so-and-so's bad energy that we weren't decreeing against appropriately. So this is what I see as the foundation of some of the so-called fortress mentality that we got into. And I think that as we became larger, more popular, there were more, more former members. Um, every time we would move and we'd buy a new place, um, there would be neighbors and people around who didn't like what we were doing. We would make a lot of noise. We had traffic, parking issues. And so there were always uh, negative forces opposing us. And it only just got bigger when we moved to Montana. Because uh, in Los Angeles, people didn't pay a lot of attention to us. There were are plenty of small religious groups in Los Angeles. But in Montana, you go and you buy a 30,000-acre ranch right next to Yellowstone Park. All of a sudden, you are important news. and. In fact, the United States Congress even went so far as to pass a resolution called the Old Faithful Protection Act, which was supposed to prevent us from using a hot spring that was on our ranch because there were concerns that if we pumped any water out of it, it could affect Old Faithful. And they worked that out later on. The environmental issues were worked out. But you can see how these things happening kind of heightened our sense of our own importance and of the forces that were arrayed against us. Um, my mother used to use a sword for spiritual, I would say, really for, for self-improvement. If people were struggling with, for example, tobacco cravings, uh, they would be told to, to get themselves cut free from negative energy with this sword. Of course, people who, who believe in hypnosis and brainwashing thought that this sword was, was being used to brainwash people. But in fact, um, people saw it as a profound spiritual initiation. And uh, you can see that my mother also pulled in from, from Asian Eastern, Eastern religions in the imagery. But the swords were actually a part of our, how we viewed ourselves almost as spiritual warriors. One of the issues that I pinpoint is the notion of perfectionism. And it, it doesn't come just from, from our church. I mean, we, we were drawing on the Christian tradition. Uh, the, Platonist tradition, and there's, there's a verse from James that my mother really liked. It, it says that every good and perfect gift cometh from above, and that with the Father there is no variableness, neither shadow nor turning. So in other words, there is only light, there is no darkness with God. And I find that this idea can lead to, um, for us who are living in mortal, changeable bodies, to try to attain perfection, either spiritually or physically, can sometimes lead to what I would consider a, a huge shadow. And I think we didn't see our shadow because we thought that we could cut it off or get rid of it in some way. And it is natural to want to believe in some kind of incorruptible world. I don't have a problem with that. But to bring it, manifest it here on Earth in some way through, our, through your spiritual practices is is risky, and I, that's where I think Jung comes in. In our group, um, the notion was that it, it was, it's actually your sexuality that leads to death. Sex, well, ultimately is, is about mortality and corruption. So my mother, in a sense, had to pretend to be almost non-human. And she was able to give these beautiful uh, sermons, and you can see some of them if you go on, on the internet. And, and her dictations, but at the same time, she had to more and more deny her humanity because some people, people would criticize her for anything she did that was human. Eating meat, for example, was, was a big issue. People found out that she ate meat and some people would leave the church. So she's there now in this sort of this bubble where she has to keep up this image and this standard. And I think it, in the end, proved too much for any human being. In the early 1980s, there was a man named Gregory Mall, 
who sued my mother and her church for $200 million. Um, and what she had supposedly done to him was um, convinced him to close down his architecture business and move to our church headquarters where he was supposed to design our church headquarters, and then that ended up not happening. But he also claimed to have been brainwashed. The thing about Mr. Mall is he had been a homosexual before he joined our church. And um, he claimed that he'd been cured of his homosexuality and that he was therefore, he'd gotten married to a woman in the church. Uh, but when he left, one of the things that bothered him is he'd heard rumors that my mother had had an affair with my, the man who became my stepfather after my father died, that they'd had an affair while my father was still alive. And this was something that extremely bothered Mr. Mall, and it came up during the trial. And my mother denied it. Um, she didn't testify about it in court, but she denied it to her, her flock and her followers. Um, so there was this sexual component to this battle. Um, Mr. Mall wrote her a letter in which he called her the great whore. And um, she, in, in, this another, in another sort of apocalyptic moment, they took a dictation which, said that, which implied that Mr. Mall was the mouthpiece of the beast of blasphemy from Revelation. So you had these sort of big, grandiose themes being thrown back and forth. So during this trial, um, our church, and I was, in, in, uh, I was a, a young adult at the time, we were decreeing all day, every day, for this, for this trial and this verdict to, to come out in our favor. And it actually didn't. Um, we lost, and we had to pay Mr. Mall one and a half million dollars, which was far more than any kind of actual financial damages than he had, that he claimed to have suffered. I mean, I think he said he did about $30,000 worth of work for the church. But he was able to get $1.5 million in that climate, which was very unfriendly to new religious movements. And it, you know, our group was not large. It um, really probably only had a couple thousand dedicated members at one time, although there were maybe 40, 50,000 people all over the world who in some way had studied with the group. But coming up with $1.5 million was a big effort for the group. And we actually ended up selling our property in California, part of that to pay for the judgment, but also because I think it was felt that this was a sign in some way that California had rejected us, the people of California had rejected us, and there were prophecies that there would be an earthquake and California would be destroyed. And so you can see that um, this just Fortress mentality then is continuing, and so we moved to Montana in uh, 1987. We moved our headquarters there. So what does Jung have to say? What kind of wisdom can we gain from, from Jung in this situation? Uh, this actually, I want to thank the artist Ken Stout for allowing me to use this picture painting, which is actually Plato's, Plato's cave. And um, of course, in Plato's version, in Plato's cave, it's not the same as the Jungian shadow. The, the shadows on the wall are actually what we can see of the perfect forms. So these perfect, this perfection exists somewhere, and we can see these imperfect shadows on the walls, and that's, that's the only way that we have of knowing what divinity is. So Jung says, that by shadow I mean the negative side of the personality, the sum of all those unpleasant qualities that we like to hide, together with the insufficiently developed functions and the contents of the personal unconscious. So um, Jung also pointed out that it's often the highly moral people, many times the religious people, who are the ones who have what we would call the biggest shadow. <laughs> there are about five things that Jung suggested we could do about the shadow. Number one, which I, would, I call it look. Bring it up and look at it. What is it? Why, why am I bothered by homosexuals? Um, the second, number two, is integrate. Integrate and reconcile the opposites. Why is there this big love-hate dichotomy here? The third thing is to assimilate into the conscious personality the contents, the material that's coming up in this shadow. And then withdraw the project projections. So pulling back in from the people that really bother us the most, wondering why we, we are, um, you know, why are we bothered by these people? 
And, uh, um, and finally, and this is the wonderful thing that happens here at the Jung Center, is to channel that shadow energy into, into creativity. And um, Jung believed that everyone carries a shadow and that the, the less conscious we are, the more black and the more dense the shadow is going to be. Um, so I see this actually a often in, in people that I know in the New Age. I think it's people who say, I have no anger, I have no hatred, um, that, that often have the biggest thing following them around. And uh, it, for example, what about hate speech? We're not allowed to say things, we're not allowed to t express our anger anymore, we're not allowed to say anything mean. You know, and obviously you can't say mean things in inappropriate situations, but the idea is, is that we're not even going to think a bad thing because that might make it happen, I find to be detrimental. Um, you may have heard this, but Jung said that the suppression of the shadow is as of little help as beheading would be to a headache. <laughs> now, in this scene here, this picture, I don't know if anybody remembers from the film, The Empire Strikes Back, but Luke goes in, into a cave where he thinks that there's something dark and evil and it looks like Darth Vader, and he takes his lightsaber, and he cuts off the head, and it turns out to be his own face inside. And I thought that, that's a pretty interesting illustration of, of this idea. So Jung had some advice. Um, how can people live with their shadow without its precipitating a succession of disasters? So I see just what happened with the shelter episode as, in our case, a disaster. Um, some people have this in their own lives, in family situations, businesses, jobs, etc. Um, in, in our church, we tried to, in a sense, cut the shadow off. We wanted to just get rid of it, deny it, burn it up. We had all these visualizations of, you know, dissolving and burning whoever was our adversary. And often this would get personal because you'd, you'd be thinking about people who were, you know, your, quote, real adversaries, and you'd be decreeing against their negative energy. And what happens when you do that, I think, is that you become less likely to talk to that person. You, you dehumanize them. If my mother had been able, my mother did sit down with Gregory Mall, but it was from a position of, I'm the spiritual teacher and you're my chila, you're my student. And it was not, with, it was not done with the sense I'd really like to resolve this issue. So, um, Viewing the shadow, I think, as an external, as another person, is really harmful to ourselves. And in our church, I think we hurt ourselves by all this demonization. And it happened within my family as well. Now, my sister Moira, who you may have seen in one of those video clips, she had this sort of dramatic exit from the church when she was a teenager, and she became involved with Christian fundamentalists and people who thought the church was evil. And so she became a prominent critic of our mother, and they later reconciled. I reconciled with her. In fact, I felt it was something that I had to do once I started getting into analysis. I had to reconcile with her. I couldn't project onto my sister all of my fears and all of my, you know, she was sort of the bad one and I was supposed to be the good one. So my own shadow story I will tell here. You can see here this is uh, me with a, a statue of Gandhi. And uh, when I was 12 years old, my mother gave me a statue of Gandhi because I was actually supposed to be a reincarnation of Gandhi. So when I was growing up, people thought that I was going to be pretty darn perfect. Um, and when I would, you know, everything I did was scrutinized and thought to be cute or precious in some way because I was supposed to be this high soul who was going to bring enlightenment to the world. Um, Whereas I really wanted to just be a teenager and be able to, you know, be with my friends and things, and I didn't have a lot of that. Um, I was in, in plays, and here I am dressed as an angel. So I was supposed to be really this um, very pure and high soul. And parents, please, if you have children, don't put that on them at a young age. If they are high souls, they will, rec they will demonstrate it uh, themselves. And I, I, I ran across... A, some people in a restaurant once who were talking about how their daughter looked just like Yogananda. And I said, you know, you have no idea what you are doing to that little girl. Please, no. Um, 
In any case, uh, as part, one of the things I did, though, that was fun is we used to dress up for Halloween as uh, different um, saint, saints of East and West. And here I am dressed as Kali, the Hindu goddess. And um, my idea, uh, you know, well, Kali, of course, is the one who, who uses a lot of swords and, and haunts the funeral grounds. And for me, I felt it was something I had to do was really to embrace the, the dark side, in a sense, in order to integrate and become a, a normal, balanced human being. So what happened to me is that I was at the ranch. I was working for my mother. I was married. I had two small children. And I developed a sexual obsession with a journalist who was covering the church. And um, it got to the point where it was seriously interfering with my work. It was something that made me think I wanted to leave. Um, I thought about committing suicide. I was very upset. And um, so that's actually how I entered analysis. Um, I was, at the time, I was projecting everything out onto this journalist and like, oh, I you know, have to be with him. And um, really what I found after I got into analysis is that what I wanted was more what he represented. I wanted more independence. I wanted more freedom. I wanted to be able to think for myself. I wanted to be able to um, also experience uh, life outside of the church, which I never had. And so instead of projecting out onto him and decreeing against his energy and deciding that he was somehow evil, I was able to draw all that stuff back in through, through the analysis work. And what ended up happening is that I ended up you know, leaving the church in stages. And I, of course, I still love my mother. And I cared about her and a lot of the people who were there. But at the same time, I was able to admit um, that I was a sexual being, that I was a human being, that I, mean, I, don't, I no longer identify with Gandhi, although I identify with his goals and you know, his vision for the world. But um, it was it's an interesting journey. I never thought that it would be 20 years later and that I would not be associated with the church at all. But in fact, that's what happened. Um, when I wrote Prophet's Daughter, I hoped that people in the church would take some of the lessons to heart and perhaps try to reform. I haven't seen a lot of that happening, although there are many people who are previously in the church who have thanked me for what I've said and, and agree with it. Um, another concept that's been helpful to me is that of the demonic. Of course, the diamond in, in Greco-Roman mythology did, was not a demon. It had neither negative or positive valence. It was simply a being. And this uh, concept has been used in Jungian psychology and also Rollo May, a humanistic psychology. And the idea is that the demonic is this urge to affirm, and it becomes evil when it takes over the total self, which I think is sort of what has started happening in my case. And then it can appear as excessive aggression. And so the, the goal would be then to, to have it come out in creativity uh, rather than um, aggression and anger. Um, therapists who work with the shadow and the demonic suggest that one of the best ways to handle this is through being flexible and versatile. Obviously, everybody's got a different shadow story. Not everything works the same. Um, my former sister-in-law, Kathleen Prophet, does, has a, a women's group that she does for working with the demonic energies, which I think is, is uh, fantastic. There are a lot of the people in our church had, have sort of moved into other uh, areas of, of work. Finally, I'd just like to talk a little bit more about the New Age shadow. As I, I think I mentioned briefly that we, we got a lot of our, our spiritual idealism not only from Christianity and the New Age, but also from Hinduism and Buddhism. And of course, Hinduism and Buddhism are the source of this idea that you can have close to perfection on Earth and that you have these embodied people who, who, who embody God. And I think that my mother who was called guru by many people, had taken on some elements of that as well. I call it the shadow of the East. And you've got some of these Tibetan tulkus who've come out, you know, the ones who are identified at, as children, as, as being reincarnations of these great high lamas. And they've come back and they've said, look, this is really dangerous and damaging. And not all these supposed tulkus actually make it. And some of them get swept under the rug and some of them are abused. 
And I think that we in the West tend to take too uncritically a lot of these claims that are made. And um, there's a fabulous book I'd like to recommend. It's by Har Harvey Aronson. It's called Buddhist Practice on Western Ground, Reconciling Eastern Ideals and Western Psychology. And I really think that, um, the, that the East can learn somewhat from the Western psychology just as much as the East has, has, has so much wisdom to impart to us in terms of yoga, meditation, spiritual practices, and things like that. So finally, before I close, I'd like to just talk for a minute about cult leaders in the shadow. Um, there are few people that arouse more negative opinion than Jim Jones. And I actually write about the Jonestown experience in this book, which is called Comparing Religions, which I am a co-author of this book by Jeffrey Kripal, my advisor at Rice University, has just come out, and I highly recommend it to, it's meant to be a, a college textbook, but I highly recommend it to anyone who's interested in just bringing themselves up to date with what's really going on with religions today and um, taking into account the criticisms of modernism and postmodernism, but also acknowledging that the religious experience, the spiritual experience is very real and is likely to be an ongoing part of, of life on Earth. It's not going, going away, so we might as well try to understand it. In any case, I talk about Jonestown in, in comparing religions, and um, many people see this as just simply a case of, of mass murder. You had 900 people that either committed suicide or were given cyanide. Um, there's a lot of things that people don't know about that group, though, and the, the religious studies scholars who've studied them say that one of the reasons they killed themselves, and because a lot of people did it voluntarily, is because their ultimate concern was threatened. Their ultimate concern was to establish a community of interracial harmony. And you had a, a, a white leadership and with a largely black, poor uh, followers. And the dynamic in Jonestown was that the white leadership wanted to show their solidarity. And they were faced with the, the notion that this community was going to be destroyed uh, they were about to lose their money from the social security checks that had been coming in. And there were um, the people who, who left the community the day before the suicide were actually the only people who knew how to farm or the main people who were farming there. So they were faced with what they saw as the imminent destruction or collapse of their dream. And that's part of why they killed themselves. Um, it's, it's possible the religious studies scholars think that if they had been left alone for another couple of months, that Jones probably would have been deposed because he was ill. And that brings up another reason why groups descend into violent episodes, and that usually a lot of times has to do with a crisis in leadership. And there was a crisis in leadership in our group. Um, my mother was ill. She actually had been epileptic for most of her life, but it was under control. Uh, during the late 1990s, she began to exhibit signs of early onset Alzheimer's disease, dementia. And um, many of the members did not want to believe this because, uh, you know, she was still actually giving dictations, but people did comment that, that, that some of the words didn't always make sense. Um, so she was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's in 1998, and she died in 2009. So I became her legal guardian, and um, you know she, within by the year 2000, she couldn't write anymore, and a few years later she couldn't speak anymore either. So it was it was, it was a long, slow decline, loss of someone who was uh, important to many people, including myself. Um, but one of the interesting things about I think our situation is that you had this intense polarization between the, the neighbors, and you can see that they're demonstrating against the church, and then us being, you know, viewing ourselves as the pure ones, the innocent victims. Um, so I, I don't have all the answers. I've, I've developed what I would consider a few warning signs of what can cause a group to, to go through into a transformation, into some episode like this. Um, I would say number one being excessive perfectionism. Number two being isolation. Um, we were not just physically isolated. We were isolated um, by our, you know, by our own the fact that we cut ourselves off deliberately from much of popular culture. Um, I would say short-circuiting negative feedback loops. That's something that scholars have identified. So people in the group were 
were basically sh shamed or shunned for bringing up the obvious problems. <laughs> um, polarization and tension with the surroundings, which you can see we had. And finally, the authoritarian rule leading to poor decision making, which ultimately leads to scapegoating. We had a lot of people who were kicked out of our group on very short notice, and still 25 years later, I have people coming to me who, you know, still processing that because all of a sudden they lost all their friends, they lost their belief system, they lost their spiritual practice, and they haven't really fully gained it, although many people have moved on and are doing some interesting and amazing things. And finally, I'd say the church leadership today, I think, has tried to address some of these, some of these problems, and I would like to see them continue to do that. In closing, you've been great, and I know that this is a lunchtime talk and some people have to go, uh, but in closing, I'll just say, this is a picture of my mother in the year 2000 with her four adult children at the time. And um, I, stro I worked hard uh, as my mother's guardian to try to, what I thought was to reclaim her humanity. And I think one of her big messages, even that she talked about Jesus Christ, is that Jesus didn't want to be made into a god. And she herself didn't want to be made into a god either. And uh, I went back into her correspondence and her letters from when she was a child and I published and edited with my sister Tatiana this book called Preparation for My Mission, which shows her as a teenager, as a human being, yes, questioning, yes, she was uh, very interested in, in spirituality and God and Christian science her whole life, and she found Christian science herself at the age of nine, uh, partly because of her epilepsy. She was hoping to, to find um, some cure or some help through Christian science. But... I wanted people to see who she was and not the sort of sanitized portrait that I could see coming out of the church, and which I'm hoping that they will rectify. So I'm going to finally read to you a couple of testimonials that I've gotten about my book. This is from a man who is a homosexual and had been in our church. Um, he says, I wanted to thank you for writing the book Prophet's Daughter. I just finished it. It took this long for me to read it because, frankly, after I was banished by our local CUT group in Alabama when they found out that I was at that time living a homosexual lifestyle, it was yet another heartbreak that led me deeper into depression than I already was when I joined CUT. I never really got over the love for your mother, and when I got the news that she had passed, it hit me very hard. I started reliving those days with CUT all over again. Your book has, in a way, started a closure process for me. I have been a born again for three years now and have been battling with the fear that the church I am now with would become CUT for me all over again. I think after I get over the shock of what I now know about Guru Ma, I will find myself in a very interesting place. And I think what he's referring to there is just the fact that Guru Ma was human. Um, the second letter I just received a few days ago, and um, it's from a man who's a few years younger than me, who finds himself looking back and resenting the restrictions that he felt he had on his adolescence growing up. He says, I have to admit I'm not completely over my anger. So many arbitrary blocks to a healthy and normal development makes me feel cheated out of some fundamental things I should have enjoyed. Realizing I sacrificed unbridled joy in sex, adventure, and just being young. It is, of course, important to let these resentments go because ultimately the only thing left to do is to heal ourselves. But I think it's healthy to take a while and lament and resent and rage and mourn. Your account helped me with that, because it's obvious that you loved your mom, and at the same time admit the damage done. I've been accepting this in my own life recently, that there is a bigger complexity to relationships with our parents than we were raised to believe. I wish I had known that 22 years ago, instead of denying and just violet flaming those feelings. I believe when we allow ourselves to feel them, it makes our love more real, because at the end of the proverbial day, we do truly love them 
our parents. You held that beautifully in your book. So it's nice as an author, you've worked so long on a project to get letters like that. And I want to thank you all for being here and sharing this journey and participating. Um, you've probably noticed it's being filmed for the web. Um, you're just, it's being filmed from the back, so I don't think you have to worry about privacy. But if anyone has any concerns, please let me know. And I would be happy to take any questions that anyone has. <laughs>